Okay, so I mentioned about the title and how uh, I thought this would be an interesting one to talk about. Here's my outline. Public health achievements are dramatic, but they're not universally shared. Familiar? Efforts to reduce or eliminate disparities have extended over many decades. Is there an epidemiology of public health or public health advancement? Not just epidemiology in the service of public health, but is there an epidemiology of public health, which is a phenomenon that we could study, and some new possibilities. Now, I want to be careful that I don't do what I did at that seminar where I kind of gave through the seminar and then I was, time was cold and I hadn't finished and gotten. So I want to go to the end and talk about some new possibilities. And then I'll come back to the other part, much of which may be familiar to you. And um, I, I thought it would be better as a presentation to do the whole thing. But uh, now I have to figure out how to move this thing forward. Uh, there's probably a way to jump. But I think what I'm going to do is just go through it and let me see it. So I talk about public health achievements, including infant mortality, but no diminution in disparities. Thanks to Bill Jenkins' and slide and another slide of Bill's. And uh, efforts to address disparities have been going on for a long time. Uh, just a quick mention again of the meeting since it does fit the context here. And the committee. So that you know, it was healthy people and the goals of healthy people and various changes. But of course, it's not just about health disparities or other things going on. And here is the bottom line on kind of what's happened. Uh, in the decade or two decades that we've been trying to focus on health disparities. Uh, the top row shows great in ethnicity, and you can see that it's been generally in balance between the number of objectives and the healthy people where the disparity has gotten better and the number of objectives where the disparity has gotten worse. Uh, but if you look down to education, which is the third row, you'll see that actually uh, it's a losing battle. And that's true also for geographic <coughs> location and disability status. So 32 years after the Hecker Report, this is what you see. As an, this is what you see on the Association of Schools and Programs of Public Health. Despite great strides in the advancement of public health, health disparities based on ethnicity, race, or socioeconomic class still exist, leading to populations that are disproportionately affected by disease and have limited access to health care. A lot of that paragraph could could come. You can find it in the words in the Hecker. And then uh, I came across a uh, news report based on a study about hookworm in Lowndes County, Alabama, which uh, was made famous in the 1960s. Uh, when, uh, is that where the bridge, you want to find this? Is it Selma? Is that? What? I'm, I'm blocking on my civil rights history. Edmonton. Is it the Edmonton Pettis Bridge? Ed, thank you. Yeah. Edmonton Pettis Bridge. Then. So, they, they are plagued with hookworm. Hookworm was a problem in the South back at the beginning of the last century. It's just incredible that it is still a problem there. So is there an epidemiology of public health? I will talk about that, but um, maybe in fact, if it's okay, maybe I'll just start here and uh, I'll run through the end and then we can go back to whatever the earlier part we want. Okay, so uh, the question was, why have compelling epidemiologic data not eliminated health disparities. And I guess I could ask the question, why would compelling epidemiologic data lead to the elimination of health disparities? Who got, where did that idea come from, that if only we had the data to show people, they would do something about it? Bill's having his head. So, have compelling epidemiologic data led to the elimination of tobacco? It's been around since the 50s. Those of you working with tobacco know that it has. What about hospital acquired infections? What about antibiotic resistance? What about widespread handgun ownership? What about climate change? I mean, data is part of an argument, but it's only part. There are many competing desires and priorities for individuals and for collective action. People do what they have to do, because they have to do it, but they may resent that. They may do what they think they ought to do, and they may also resent that. And they may do what they want to do, that's what they really like to do, but they may regret that. <laughs> and they sometimes just do whatever. We're people. Yeah. So epidemiology 
has been developing and trying to focus increasingly on social determinants, though if you go back long enough, you find that epidemiology was definitely about social determinants. But uh, professions and scientific <coughs> fields evolve over time. They evolve in relation to opportunities and to social forces and political forces and economic opportunities and all these other things. So when we had the germ theory, that all of a sudden opened up all sorts of opportunities for epidemiologic advances and other things that weren't, were, were really important, like poverty, they got not as, they weren't as specific, they didn't produce the specific immediate changes as much, so they got kind of left behind. And now we're coming back to some of those social determinants. Um, this is, these are just examples of people who have talked, spoken, and written about this area. There are many others I am not including because I just wanted to give some credit, but I'm not trying to give credit, I'm just letting you know. This is a well-developed field uh, there's a terrific textbook that Nancy Krieger has, has published with zillions of references. My attempt to talk about this area in a broad sense is a talk I gave uh, a year ago that is available online, this slides and an audio recording at that same link as the others. Epidemiology, Equity, Economics, Evolution, and Enlightenment. So e epidemiology tells us that yes, social determinants are really important. Uh, equity indicate, or research on equity makes it clear that social justice reflects the distribution of power, both in terms of what actually happens, and even the definition of it, even what is social justice. That economics, economic resources are fundamental to public health, and their distribution depends on social forces. Evolution is something that I think we ought to keep in mind, because fundamentally, we in our societies are expressions of biology evolving through time as an emergent phenomenon. We, we, think, we, we may think we're running things, but it's actually much bigger than we are. And I have enlightenment because I think broader and deeper understanding of our nature and our environment may help humanity to manage our collective lives better, advancing public health in the present and future. So that's a synopsis of a 45 minute talk I think. I want to spend a little more time on these parts of the book. This, this is the reformulation. We are systems. We have, there are 86 billion neurons or something like that in your brain and many more glial cells and then there are the microorganisms which live up there too. So um, there's a lot of complexity. And our complexity is within a very complex system or systems. So life is an emergent phenomenon. An emergent phenomenon is one that arises from the actions of innumerable agents, each doing its own thing in a context. And the phenomenon that emerges is you can't predict it in many cases. It's, you, you, you can construct simulations where you have even little agents that are operating by very, sim very, um, very simple rules, so agent-based models where this agent could do this, this, or this and then you have 10,000 of them and you watch them go forward in time, the results of whatever they're doing, you, you often can't predict. Um, <clears throat> so we can't really expect to predict what's going on in our world. And some, somebody mentioned the election before. Well, the election was an example. <laughs> A lot of people were surprised. So this complexity, of course, confronted the very first living organisms. And they had much less to I mean, they have, they were much, they had many fewer resources to grapple with this great complexity when the first living organism emerged and emerged on land and so on. And we have evolved over these billions of, billions of years an ability or abilities to cope with complexity, but of course we do that by simplifying. Um, we create simplified representations of our perceptions, so we don't, you know, you see around you where there's all these stimuli coming in, but there are very many of them that you're not even noticing because you see only a certain portion of the, of the electromagnetic spectrum. We hear only certain frequencies. Dogs can hear frequencies that we can't hear, for example. Uh, and we 